Well, I think there's a number of things we need to tease apart when we think about net neutrality. Um, there's the fundamental arguments about what that means in, in, in technical sense, and we could look at that. And then there's the, the context in which people legislate for net neutrality, which is done on a per country basis, and the way in which it fits into each country's legislation, which leads to some of the slightly weird arguments that you hear. So I think if we start with the technicals, that's where I'm safest. I mean, the idea of net neutrality is that you shouldn't discriminate on the basis of you know, where IP packets come from, so what server you're talking to or who the client is, um, and you shouldn't discriminate on the basis of the protocol being used. Um, now, we've seen this a number of times. We've seen certain sites getting slowed down because, well, we don't like what they're doing. And this is the argument that uh, net neutrality advocates would have, which is that it can't be at the whim of a commercial provider, a service provider, to, to favour some websites over another. And it's particularly the case uh, there's a concern that, for example, uh, ISPs might be able to favour some uh, websites over others uh, by asking people to pay for preferential access. So, um, you know, large company A pays, you know, uh, the internet service provider to make sure that their website's fastest. And that's considered a disadvantage uh, when it comes to innovation because obviously small, new, interesting startups wouldn't have the budget to be able to go in and pay those extra premium. And in fact, it, you know, there's good arguments here about much innovation has happened on the internet. We have seen lots of small companies grow into really big companies on the internet in a short time. And uh, we do have to remember that Amazon and eBay used to be minnows compared to uh, what was out there. But things like um, WhatsApp and Instagram, you know, if, if the likes of Facebook, uh, or even before that, if MySpace had been able to buy bandwidth and hence discriminate uh, against Facebook, then Facebook wouldn't have risen. So, you know, there's, these are, I mean, these are arguments that can be had about the importance of the openness for innovation. Um, so that's about discriminating based on the service or the IP address. There's also discrimination by protocol, and this was quite popular for a number of years because um, certain protocols came to the attention of the service providers because uh, they were consuming lots of bandwidth, so particularly file sharing. Now, whether the ISPs took a moral stance on this and said that file sharing is wrong because it can only ever be used for you know, a breach of copyright, um, or whether they simply took the view that, well, we don't have enough bandwidth to go around and these are heavy users uh, and they're making, you know, they're ruining it for everyone else. Um, doesn't really matter. But they started discriminating against that. And uh, BitTorrent was the classic where lots of people were discriminating against BitTorrent. Um, but then, of course, it turns out that many people were using BitTorrent for perfectly legitimate reasons. Yes, there were BitTorrent file sharing, and there still is plenty of it around. Um, and, uh, but then World of Warcraft uses BitTorrent to, to update its very big patches. Um, very useful it is too, because that means that in the days when my two kids used to play World of Warcraft as well, then it, we only had to download one patch to the house and then it replicated inside the house. So there's perfectly good reasons. Discrimination on protocol is a very blunt instrument because you have no idea what people are using it for uh, in reality. So those are some of the arguments about um, uh, why net neutrality. There's always the case that service providers have the right uh, to engage in certain traffic ma uh, management, even where there is strong net neutrality law, in order to keep the network operating. So, for example, during a distributed denial of service attack, uh, one of the things that lots of the ISPs do is they will shut down where the attacks are coming from and they will throttle them and it's like you couldn't say that that's a bad thing. And likewise, as we already know, it's certainly in the UK, uh, but elsewhere, um, there are varying degrees of uh, blacklisting of websites, some of it because the material is clearly illegal. Uh, others, for example, certain countries have um, lists of sites reckoned to have adult content, and while not illegal, uh, many countries have put in place legislation that says that, um, that, that uh, consumers need to opt in to see that um, rather than opt out. So there is filtering going on. Uh, there are times when ISPs need to do things. And so it really is about getting a, a sort of a rational, balanced view on the, on the technical side about promoting innovation um, and not allowing incumbents to basically just hold on to their business because they're the ones with the deep pockets. Um, and that's, that, I think that many people would view that as being critical for the success of the internet. 
So that's sort of the technicals, and that's the what is net neutrality. Don't discriminate based on you know protocols or sources. Um, but then we get into you know a lot of the arguments that are going on at the moment, and particularly with the FCC, um, is really about previously the way in which the, uh, it was decided that they would try to enforce net neutrality, which was to use a particular piece of uh, uh, prior, prior legislation uh, that had been used to regulate um, phone companies for many years. And this leads to lots of arguments which, in a sense, are to do with the details of that legislation and not to do with this, really the issue of net neutrality. Buried in the legislation is the requirement for universal service provision and the ability to essentially um, tax all the consumers a small amount in order to make sure you can deliver service everywhere. And that was very important. The universal service provision for telephony was a major thing um, 80 years ago or something, uh, which was to make sure that everyone could get a phone since it was considered critical, especially as we started moving to you know, emergency services available by phone. And the ability to make, in our case in the UK, 999 calls um, um, uh, at any time. And indeed, we see that today. You see on your mobile phone, you can always make emergency calls. So embedded in that legislation was, you know, things that were there for a perfectly sensible reason. But it's now being used as sort of a bit of a bogeyman to say, well, in the future, uh, under the current US legislation in the US, uh, government could decide that these ISPs must raise these enormous tax levies. And that's being used as an argument as to why we can't possibly have this legislation on the books. Because that's got nothing to do with anyone else anywhere else in the world. There's a very specific argument within the US. And so we need to tease apart those issues that are to do with the underlying philosophy of net neutrality and its you know, uh, enabling innovation from the very specifics of what happens in any given country. So again, we look at some other countries. I mean, the EU has put in place uh, legislation about net neutrality. Although there are some people who are concerned there's like loopholes there because in Portugal, at least one provider is, um, is charging uh, differentially for different services. And that's viewed as perhaps not in the spirit of what the uh, legislation was meant to achieve. But on the other hand, it is legal. So uh, they can currently do it under EU law. And there's other, you know, other countries have looked at this in different ways. India certainly I was very concerned at some of the proposals around um, sort of free internet access for certain websites sponsored by certain large companies would essentially prevent any indigenous um, service provision and you know, social media provision in particular uh, uh, coming forward. So that's, we've got to look at each country in turn, try to understand what's really going on. And then the question is, of course, that could the, could the change in the position in the US radically affect anyone outside the US. I mean, most of this really reflects around the, the, the consumer internet service provider. I will not transit you know, that, uh, US consumer networks in order to get to the services, even if from the UK or elsewhere in Europe or anywhere else in the world, we're going to some large server farm somewhere. Uh, the chances are we don't, don't necessarily traverse those networks. Um, so for a lot of people, you know, it wouldn't make any difference. But then actually we need to look more generally at the way in which large scale services are deployed these days. Um, most of your streaming video comes from a content delivery network where the content's been replicated all around the planet. And the fact that um, you know, in the UK, large amounts of our content will be coming across the very narrow pond to the Republic of Ireland, um, we'll be getting all of our content from there if, it, if it's not already in the UK then in fact what the US does and what US carriers do in the US will have absolutely zero effect on us whatsoever. The danger always is though is the US, even though the governance structures and everything else for the internet has changed over the years, the US is still seen as sort of, you know, a leader in this area. And one of the concerns that many folks have is that if they start going down this path, how many other people might you know, think it acceptable to go down that path? Although as I say, given that the EU in particular has put in place legislation um, then uh, I don't see us doing a U-turn on that. Um, if by us I mean those of us currently in Europe. Let's, let's see where Brexit takes us uh, uh, with that legislation in the future. People pay for services they want. They usually pay more if they want a better service, right? What, what's different about this sort of rollback of net neutrality in those terms? Well, yeah, I mean, the world is full of, you know, first-class seats and planes and business class and a 
premium economy and economy and people pay different prices for, for different things. And you know, in the in the internet world, you would say that uh, you know there are different tariff structures available. Primarily, and I, here I can only really speak you know for the UK. Primarily, simply based around volume. So it's not about discriminating one against the other, uh, one service against the other, but simply by volume. So people will buy, I think I have four gigabytes a month on my phone at the moment, and uh, I, up, I up and down that depending on my usage. Um, I have to have you know, no limits at home because I simply cannot control the amount of content that, you know, uh, now that I have two grown, <laughs> grown lads at home streaming videos all the time and playing online games, uh, uh, we would blow, we would blast through any cap that anyone would want to put on us. So there is that. It's the differential pricing between different services, and it's viewed as um, just a very uninternet thing to do um, to differentiate between the services. Uh, and I think that's slightly different from uh, having you know tiered prices, um, which uh, you know simply reflects the amount of resource that you're using in the network. And perhaps that's where this really comes down to is that you know. A packet is a packet. I mean, yes, maybe many of the ISPs would like to look at some of those packets and go, ooh, that content is of higher value and someone's making money out of it. Why aren't we getting a piece of the action? You know, that's a very natural commercial behavior. But um, we don't charge differentially for, you know, a kilogram parcel, depending what the contents are. I mean, maybe you pay insurance, but the actual carriage is the same. Uh, so it's the same principle here. It shouldn't be that the content is the thing, which is either the service or the protocol, should dictate that these things are different. Because bits is bits is bits. It's like it's just like how many of them they want to move. And I think if we stick with that, then you know that that general principle, with the exceptions I mentioned about you know defending the network against attack and other scenarios that are perfectly valid for, as I say, an operator to manage their network, but stick with that principle, then you know that seems a reasonably sensible one and. Uh, you know, the basis on which many view the internet as having been a great success. There's a difference between the physics and the engineering. Engineering one of those gates and actually changing all a computer architecture to move towards those type of Fredkin gates is going to take an awful lot of effort and an awful lot of cost. But in principle, if we could do that and if we had a perfect, perfect Fredkin gate, then there would be no energy cost to computing. 